Hello and welcome to this GCSE chemistry video about the properties of small molecules. We'll start by taking a look in general at electrical conductivity and melting and boiling points. And from there, we'll focus in on the nature of intermolecular forces and how those forces can vary for different types of molecule. And we'll finish by taking a look at some larger covalent molecules called polymers. Covalent substances are formed when atoms share pairs of electrons to fill their outer electron shell and become stable. The shared pair of electrons is a covalent bond, and it's the covalent bond, that shared pair of electrons, that holds the atoms together. And the covalent bonds between atoms are very strong, which means that they are very difficult to break. They, it requires a lot of energy to separate the atoms out from that covalent bond. And the type of atoms that form covalent bonds are nonmetals. They bond together by sharing electrons. And this makes sense if you consider the fact that generally nonmetals need to gain electrons to fill their outer shell that is usually almost full. And so if two atoms both need to gain electrons, the only way that they could do that is by sharing electrons, because they couldn't transfer electrons between one and the other, and then both have a full outer shell. There are three different types of covalently bonded substances that you need to know about. There are small molecules, sometimes referred to as simple molecules, very large molecules, for instance, things called polymers, and also giant covalent structures. Electric current is the flow of charged particles. To conduct electricity, the charged particles must be free to move. So for a material to be a conductor of electricity, it needs to contain charged particles in its structure, and those charged particles must be free to move. Substances that are made from molecules do not have an overall electric charge as they contain covalent bonds where electron pairs are shared. And so as a result, small molecules do not conduct electricity. So if we connected a circuit with a power supply and a bulb and connected it up, as I'm showing here, with a gap in the circuit, and then we put a material into that gap to try to complete the circuit, we could prove whether the material was an electrical conductor or not. And so if we were to fill the gap with some kind of substance made up of simple covalent molecules, the bulb would not light up because the circuit is not complete. And this is because the molecules do not have electrical charge and so no electric current can flow. Particle theory can be used to help explain changes of state. The particles in a solid are held together in ordered rows and a regular pattern and the particles are not free to move around, only to vibrate about a fixed position. And this is because there are strong forces between the particles holding them in that fixed position. In order to turn a substance from a solid into a liquid, these forces need to be overcome or at least weakened. And so energy needs to be put in for this to happen. And this energy is only supplied once a substance reaches its melting point. Once a substance has been turned from a solid into a liquid, there are still forces between those particles, but they are weaker than previously, which is why the particle arrangement for a liquid is much more disordered and more random than it is for a solid. Breaking these forces is necessary to convert a liquid into a gas because once a liquid has turned into a gas, those particles have actually got no forces between them. And that's why the gas particles are arranged entirely randomly and entirely separately and they're very disorganised. And the energy required to convert a liquid into a gas is supplied once a material reaches its boiling point. The amount of energy needed to change state from solid to liquid and liquid to gas will depend on the strength of the forces between the particles. 
And the type of substance itself, so that means its structure or its bonding, will affect the type of particle a substance is made up of. And so this could mean we're talking about molecules or we could be talking about ions in a lattice. And this will affect the type of force between the particles of that substance and the strength of these forces. A useful generalisation to keep in mind is that the stronger the forces between particles, the harder they will be to separate. And so the higher the melting and boiling points will be for that substance. When melting and boiling substances made up of small molecules, the particles being separated during the change of state are the molecules. And a molecule is two or more atoms chemically joined together by sharing pairs of electrons to form a covalent bond. I'm showing five examples of molecules that could make up a particular substance. These types of substance only have weak forces between their molecules, known as intermolecular forces, where inter means between. And so between molecule forces is the literal meaning of their name. And since these forces are weak, they need very little energy to overcome. And so small molecules have relatively low melting and boiling points, which means that substances that consist of small molecules are usually gases or liquids at room temperature, which is taken to be 20 degrees Celsius. And these substances are liquids or gases at room temperature because the molecules that make up the substance have enough energy to overcome the intermolecular forces, those forces between the molecules holding the particles close together. Boiling water is a really useful example that illustrates the connection between intermolecular forces and melting and boiling substances made of small molecules. When you fill a kettle, it is, of course, full of water in the liquid state. And you can see this from the particle arrangement that I'm showing inside the kettle. On the right hand side, I'm showing an enlarged diagram of the interaction between two water molecules. And you can see that inside each of the water molecules, there are two covalent bonds. And I'm showing those covalent bonds as grey sticks. And then there is the intermolecular force holding the molecules close together. And I'm showing this as a dashed line connecting the two molecules. And so the dashed line is the intermolecular force and the grey sticks are the covalent bond. As the water boils, energy from the kettle is transferred to the water molecules. And these particles use the energy to overcome the intermolecular forces holding it in the liquid state. And so it starts to turn into a gas and some of the molecules will leave the kettle. As time passes, more and more particles will turn from a liquid state into a gas. And then the kettle will switch itself off and keep most of the boiled water inside the kettle. We might call what comes out of a kettle steam, but it is still water. It's just now in the gas state. And you can see that from the particle arrangement of the water molecules that I'm showing that have escaped the kettle. They are very randomly arranged and there is a large gap between the molecules. But importantly, they are still recognisable as the same water molecules that were present inside the kettle. Since the intermolecular forces are weak compared with covalent bonds, it is the intermolecular forces between molecules that are overcome when a substance melts or boils, not covalent bonds. All of the covalent bonds in a molecule are still intact once a substance made of molecules has boiled. And this is why melting point and boiling point are bulk properties. Since melting point is controlled by the forces between the molecules, not any interaction inside the molecule itself. Intermolecular forces increase with the size of the molecule. And so larger molecules have higher melting and boiling points. Let's look at two examples of where this is relevant that you need to know about. First, the halogens. As we go down group seven, 
known as the halogens, the atoms get larger. These halogens actually exist as diatomic molecules, which means that they are a molecule of two atoms covalently bonded together. And since the atoms get larger as you go down the group, the molecules get larger. And this means that the intermolecular forces holding a substance made of molecules together will increase. And this, in turn, will increase the melting point and the boiling point of this substance. And this gives rise to some striking differences between the physical states of each of the elements in group 7. Fluorine and chlorine, as relatively small molecules, exist as gases at room temperature. And this is because the intermolecular forces in those substances are very weak and so room temperature is hot enough for the molecules to have enough energy to overcome the intermolecular forces holding those particles together. Bromine as a larger molecule will have stronger intermolecular forces and so it exists as a liquid at room temperature and iodine and astatine are bigger still, and so the intermolecular forces in iodine, for instance, are so strong that actually at room temperature there is not enough energy for the molecules to overcome the forces holding the particles together. Another example are hydrocarbons. For instance, a family of chemicals called alkanes. These are made of carbon atoms and hydrogen atoms covalently bonded together, and they are a family of chemicals of different sizes. You can see here I'm showing methane, ethane, and propane. These are the smallest of the three alkanes, but you can see that each gets larger because we're adding a carbon atom and two hydrogen atoms to the molecules, and so the chain length will increase. And therefore, as we work our way down the three that I'm showing here, the intermolecular forces between molecules making up a substance of propane, for instance, will be stronger than those intermolecular forces in ethane. And so the melting point and boiling point of propane will be higher than for methane or ethane. And in general, as the hydrocarbon length increases, its melting point and boiling point will increase as well. Polymers are very large molecules made up of lots of repeating sections. Polymers are formed when lots of small molecules join together. A polymer molecule could contain thousands or millions or billions of atoms, and so there's no way that we could easily draw that out in full. And so instead, we represent polymers by drawing that part of it that repeats itself thousands and thousands of times. When we do this, we try to show the polymer in full displayed formula. And so in this instance here, I'm showing polyethene, or polythene it's sometimes called, which is made up of a repeating unit of two carbon atoms joined by strong covalent bonds, and each of those has got two strong covalent bonds to two hydrogen atoms. And so this is the section of the polymer of poly ethene that repeats itself lots of times. And we show that it repeats itself lots of times by putting it inside some brackets. And we put two covalent bonds, one either side of the polymer's repeat unit, that stretch out beyond the contents of the bracket and trail outside of those brackets. These are usually referred to as trailing bonds. We finish our representation of a polymer by putting a little n outside of those brackets in the bottom right hand position. And what this is representing is the number of times that this repeat unit repeats itself. And this can vary from one molecule to another, so we don't know what that number actually is, but we know it is a very large number. As a result of this, polymers don't have a definite molecular formula. We know n is a huge number, but we don't know what that number is. And all of the polymer chains might be constructed in the same way, but they're all different lengths. And so to show the molecular formula for polyethene, we would write C2H4, because that's the formula of the repeat unit, and then we would put brackets around it, and then we would write the n outside the brackets to show that that formula is repeating a huge number of times. 
As we know, intermolecular forces increase with the size of the molecule, and so larger molecules have higher melting and boiling points. Polymers have very large molecules, where the atoms in the polymer molecule are linked to other atoms by strong covalent bonds. I'm showing a long molecule here to illustrate the idea, but in fact, polymers are much larger than this. When polymers melt, the covalent bonds don't break. It's the forces between the molecules, and these are not as strong as the covalent bonds. But intermolecular forces between polymer molecules are relatively strong compared to the intermolecular forces between small molecules. And this is because polymers are so much larger than a typical small molecule. And that means there is a huge surface area for these large polymer molecules to interact with each other. And so we get many more intermolecular forces between the polymer chains. And this means that the melting points for polymers is usually going to be above room temperature, which is taken to be 20 degrees C. And so these substances are solids at room temperature, which is really important given the range of things that we use polymers for. For instance, polyethene is used for carrier bags, polystyrene is used for packaging, and polyvinyl chloride is used for plastic pipe work. All of these uses require the polymers to be in the solid state. Okay, that's the end of this video. Thanks for listening.